So, uh, our subject for consideration is a time for peace. God's roadmap to peace and peace on earth. What I think is very important to keep in mind is that the world over, we all want peace, don't we? And when we see the horrors in different parts of the world on our television sets, or listen to things on the radios, or look at the newspapers, we are very conscious, aren't we, that the world, in many respects, is in such a desperate state. The world is filled with, con with uh, people who are dictators, who are bullies or tyrants, and spend their lives in pushing people and spend their lives trying to amass wealth at whatever cost. And so what we want to do for a few moments this evening is to remind ourselves as to God's plan and purpose. Now this phrase, roadmap to peace, was really coined a, a number of years ago through one of the presidents of the United States of America, and we'll come to him a little later. And part of that process, uh, this particular president would see and ha was fully aware of the problems and the challenges that faced the world in the context of world peace. And he had come to an understanding that really the true key to it all, the key to world peace as far as he was concerned, was to be able to unlock and deal with the troubles in the Middle East. Well, that's a good place to start. Because really what the Bible shows is that ultimately true and everlasting peace, it can only come when there is peace, and this is, this is the point, when there is peace in Jerusalem. The Bible shows us that there will only ever be true and everlasting peace when the Prince of Peace. Now, the Bible describes Jesus as the Prince. Jesus has many titles in the Bible. Savior, the Anointed One, the King. But one of his titles in the Bible is the Prince of Peace. The Lord God has a number of titles in the Bible. And the various names of God show his character. And one of the titles of God in the Bible is the God of Peace. So we have the God of Peace. We have the Prince of Peace. But you see, it goes a little further. Because in the Bible, it also talks about the city of Jerusalem. And basically, broadly speaking, the name, the word Jerusalem means Jerusalem, the city of peace. So right at the very outset, we are beginning to have the idea that in the Bible, God is preoccupied with peace. That's why he's called the God of peace. And that's why his son is called the Prince of Peace. And that's why Jerusalem, a most important city in God's plan and purpose, is called the City of Peace. So, Ultimately, God has always wanted peace. It's not a new idea for God. God, God has always wanted peace because he is the God of peace. So, 
Let's for a few moments think about the state of the world. This plane, uh, they've actually decommissioned. Does anybody know what the name of this plane is called? Anybody know? Some of the youngsters? Yes, Ethan? You've heard the talk before, mate. <laughs> Terrible. Just can't get the stuff these days, can you? Do you know how fast it goes? Gotcha. Anybody, anybody want to have a guess? What, what's, the, what's the top speed of this plane? Pardon? Above Mach 2. What's that in layman's terms? <laughs> okay, better. Yeah? All right. 2,000 miles an hour. Incredible. This machine uh, was at the cutting edge of uh, the military. It could fly so high and they couldn't detect it, right? They, they couldn't detect it. The, uh, they, they actually, the, the, the enemy could not detect it because it was designed in a certain way. The radars couldn't detect it. And it, was, it could fly so high, they couldn't locate it with their missiles. Practically invisible. Couldn't see it. And so these are really some of the things that the world will actually implement. And as far as they, were, they are concerned, the, 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 this is the answer for peace. To bring more war. And so in a, a very real way, we're talking about it in, a very, in, in almost contradictory terms. The world wants pre peace, so it brings war. God wants peace, so he brings that ultimate peace. So, let's open our Bibles, please, to the book of Isaiah. We haven't had a reading so let's open our Bibles at Isaiah chapter 26. Isaiah chapter 26. We've put up a couple of verses there, but it, it is always important, and those who come here on a regular basis will know that what we try and do is to speak from God's word without taking verses out of context. That's very important. So when we come in to read God's word, it's always important what does the verse say? Ah, but when we read around those verses, we find that it tells you a lot more. So, Isaiah chapter 26, let's go in verse 2. In that day shall this song be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. Salvation will God appoint for walls and bulwarks. Open ye the gates, that the righteous nation which keepeth the truth may enter in. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Now let's read that verse 3 again very carefully. Verse 2 again for connection. Open you the gates that the righteous nation which keepeth the truth may enter in. Which keepeth the truth. So in our mind we have a picture of a, of a city. And the command goes out to open the gates that the righteous nation which keepeth the truth may enter in. So the, this city is opened up to invite people who are keeping the truths of God and that nation is described as being righteous. So these people, whoever they are, are invited by God, open the gates and let those righteous people come in. Thou will keep him in perfect peace. In my Bible it says, thou will keep him in perfect. Peace, peace. Now, so often in the Bible, those of us who look at the Bible and try and understand it may appreciate that when, you, when we're told something once in the Bible, it, it's, it's important. Ah, but when it tells you it twice, 
it's really emphasizing that this thing is so important. And some of us might think of some examples in our mind. Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind or thoughts or imagination is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. Now look at verse 3. The principle there is this. Ultimately, that verse is saying we can have a peace. There is a peace of mind here whose mind is stayed. That mean, means whose mind is fixed, whose mind is focused, whose mind is attentive to God's word. Now, now ever before we look at the problems and the state of the world and you know, the war and the, the violence and the horrors that we see, we need to bring this actually a little nearer to home first. It reminds me of uh, a picture somebody once showed me. A beautiful painting. It's a painting of a storm. A, a tremendous storm in a forest. The trees are blowing. The on, and, the, and the leaves are blowing all over the place. And the branches are swaying. It's an incredible storm. And in the top right hand corner of that painting is a bird. A a songbird. And that bird, oblivious of all the chaos and all the, the wind and, 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 and all that's going on, oblivious to all that, this bird is just there at the top of that branch, singing its heart out. And, and, and that reminds me of this here. Whose mind is stayed. If we have our minds fixed on the things of God, no matter what's going on around us, yes, it could be difficult, the challenge could be difficult to bear, but God promises us in the midst of the storms of life, if we're like that songbird, singing our heart out, giving glory to God, oblivious of all the chaos and the war and the horrors around us, if we're like that bird singing our heart out and just giving God glory as we are supposed to do, just like that songbird, then we find that there is a peace in our hearts. A peace, as the Bible puts it, that surpasses all understanding and that's what God's word does for us ever before we look at war and, and all the horrors we're looking at the peace of God that can rule in our hearts so yes when there, when, when there is military action oh yes when perhaps one day there are troops in these streets of Nottingham because we don't know what political unrest will unfold as the years go by in this country, in Europe, in different parts of the world. We see it on our screens and we almost divorce ourselves from the fact, oh well, that's that country. We don't know. And every four or five years in this country there are riots, we know that well enough. One city, another city, another city, and there is chaos and copycat rioting. We know that well enough. But in our hearts, just that, that, like that songbird, there has to be that peace because our minds are stayed or supported like a mainstay of a building that pillar if our minds are fixed on the things of God we will not be easily shaken so <clears throat> verse 4 verse 3 that will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee 
So this idea of peace, first and foremost then, there is something from within that can be influenced, not through our own strength, remember, but because God has said so and we trust in him. Trust ye in the Lord. There it is again, end of verse 3, trusteth. And then verse 4, trust. There is the emphasis, that twofold emphasis again. Because he trusteth in, the, in thee. Trust in the Lord forever. And then we move down to verse 7. The way of the just is uprightness. Thou most upright dost weigh the, the thou most upright doth weigh the path of the just. Now look at verse eight. Yea, in the way of thy judgments, O Lord, have we waited for thee. That's interesting. What does he mean in verse eight? In the way of thy judgments, O Lord, have we waited for thee? You see, what the writer is saying is that before there can be true and everlasting peace, as a prerequisite, in other words, before true peace can come, there has to be judgment. There has to be a time of judgment. God will deal with that problem, with that issue, to destroy that which is wicked or corrupt, first there has to be judgment, and then, after that judgment takes place, then will there be peace. And that is a very important principle that runs right the way through the Bible. Carry on again, please. Yea, in the way of thy judgments, O Lord, have we waited for thee. He's saying, Lord, be before there is true peace, before there is true everlasting peace, you have to deal with it. You have to pour out your wrath. Oh, yes. He's saying to God, Lord, I'm waiting for your judgment. Because he understands that the only way there will be true peace on earth, God firstly will deal and pour out his judgments. The desire of our soul is to thy name and to the rem remembrance of thee. With my soul have I desired thee in the night, yea, with my spirit within me will I seek thee early. For when thy judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. End of verse 9 is so important. He's saying, before there is peace, there has to be judgments. And after judgments, there will be righteousness. That brings peace. Verse 4, verse 9 again. Reading carefully. For when thy judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. That word righteousness is right wiseness. It means doing the right things of God. So notice our equation thus far. In order before there, are, there is true and everlasting peace, verse 9, end of, firstly, God's judgments. For when thy judgments are in the earth, the products of God's judgments will be righteousness, which will bring in everlasting peace. And so the writer is very aware of this important equation that runs right the way through the Bible. God's judgments that will bring righteousness, that will ultimately bring peace. That's so important, please, to bear in mind. In the way of thy judgments, O Lord, have we waited for thee. The desire of our soul is to thy name. He's waiting for God's judgments. And for those who want to understand God's word, our minds should really be aligned to that. Yes, we want God to return to this earth, Jesus to return to the earth, to set up the kingdom. 
Yes, we want the inhabitants of the world to know righteousness. Yes, we want the earth to be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. But before all that takes place, God will wipe away the wickedness and corruption and violence and to deal with it for how it deserves to be dealt with. With my soul have I desired thee in the night, yea, with my, with my spirit within me will I seek thee early. Judgments that will bring in learning righteousness. Isaiah chapter 32, over a few pages, just for ease. So those who are turning, please, can know that these verses are there. Isaiah 32 and verse 17. And the work of righteousness shall be peace. And the effects of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. So, there's the equation again. Judgments, then righteousness that will bring in peace. And the effects of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. It's like that. It's like a, a, a circular thing, isn't it? God's way is such that he will deal and bring about that ultimate peace. And that can only come through judgments. The work of righteousness shall be peace. And the effects of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. That's important to, to bear in mind. Now look at the, at the chapter itself in verse 16 of Isaiah 32. Then judgment, there it is again. Then judgment shall dwell in the wilderness and righteousness remain in the fruitful field. And the work of righteousness shall be peace. And the effects of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. There's our equation again, notice. Verse 16. Judgment, righteousness, verse 17, peace. That is a, a very important principle to try and take hold of and understand. So, what is righteousness? Integrity, equity, justice, straightness, right ways you see God has a plan and purpose to bring about righteousness that envelops the whole world God wants integrity and equity and justice and straightness and right ways God is a God that deals with those principles and God wants us to do the same that's why he is a righteous God. God wants what is best. Judgments, it is a verdict. Favorable or unfavorable. All depends on what side of the fence you're sitting on. So, you go to a court of law. And the judgment is that you are allowed to go free. Or the judgment is you are incarcerated for life plus 25 years. There's nothing wrong with a judgment in itself. The, 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 the word, it's actually, in effect, that sentence that is passed. When the Lord Jesus Christ returns and there will be a judgment, there will be the judgment and those who are found worthy will be given everlasting life. That's their judgment. That's a good thing. But by the same token, those who are found unworthy, they also will be judged, and the judgment or the sentence that is passed is that they will return to the grave. That's God's judgment, God's verdict. And so what the Bible shows us is that when the Lord Jesus Christ returns, we're told in the scriptures that God, that he will judge the quick and the dead. 
the quick are those who are alive, the moving people, the quick, the moving, the judge, the quick and the dead. And so Jesus would be that judge. And the word peace, well, it means welfare, health, prosperity, favor, friend, health, peace, prosper, rest, safe, salute. So with this idea of peace, God wants to bring a sense of prosperity, of favor, of rest, a, a, a cessation of sin, that spiritual welfare. God wants that peace. And the Bible talks about it in terms also of having that rest from sin. The Bible says that when Jesus returns and we go into, into the kingdom, it will be a place of rest. It describes it, the kingdom as entering into God's rest. Not because we're tired. We're told on the seventh day, God rested. It doesn't mean he, God was tired. It means he stopped, he ceased from the work of creation. And what the Bible shows is that when we enter into God's eternal rest, there, there will be no longer this struggle and fight against sin, against death. It will be a thing of the past, you understand. So here then is our equation. God's judgments that will bring about righteousness, that will bring about peace. And so that equation, as I said, is so important to, to understand and to appreciate. And so the writer, the writer throughout the Bible, particularly in the prophets and also in the Psalms, he says, Lord, please bring your judgments because I know it will culminate, it will conclude with a peace, that peace on earth. So, for a few moments then, I think it's important just to remind ourselves of the effects of the, the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Zechariah chapter 14, please. Zechariah Malachi, the second to last book in the Old Testament. As I said, I put these verses up there so you can make a note of them, so you can go away in your own time and have a look at them. It's, it's very important. And also to look at these verses in context. Zechariah chapter 14, and we're going in at verse, verse 4. And this is talking about, it's a prophecy of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ back to the earth. Now there are some, some people around who believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is already ruling. Some believe that Lord Jesus Christ has already returned. And so it's important to understand that in Zechariah it's a prophecy of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. If we had time we could remind ourselves that in Acts chapter 1 verse 11 remember when Jesus leads his disciples out of Jerusalem to the Mount of Olives remember and he ascends and Acts 1.11, it says, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus that ye have seen go into, into heaven shall so come in like manner. And so he ascends to heaven. And the prophecy tells us that where Jesus ascended, he will come again. It will be a literal physical return. It has to be so because look what the verse says. Verse 4. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave, split in the midst thereof, toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall re be removed toward the north and half toward the south. You see, when Jesus returns, there will be a cataclysmic earthquake. The whole topography of the land will alter tremendously. Now we're talking about a literal, phys literal physical return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know why I know it's literal and physical? 
because it says so in Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 4. And so the return of the Lord Jesus Christ is, is very much at the heart, very much at the hub of, of, of true, honest Bible reading. Okay, let's go back to Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11. I'm going in. At verse 1. This is another prophecy about the return of Jesus as being king. Verse 1 of Isaiah 11. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And it shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. Those seven attributes shown through the king now we've just had the elections now you might know that we as Christadelphians we don't vote for the politicians we had a baptism on uh, on Friday evening the same day that uh, people went to the polls and we talked about how the person that was baptized, he had already cast his vote, for want of a better phrase. When the, the country is pinning their hopes and aspirations upon a, a leader with all its manifesto as how to go, go to govern the country, that follower had pinned all his hopes and expectations and aspirations on the Lord Jesus Christ. And now he's beginning to understand the greatest manifesto the world <coughs> will ever, ever read. What a manifest! You mean you will allow me to live forever? Oh yes. You mean there will be no more pain? Oh yes. No more suffering? Oh, yes. No more anxiety? Oh, yes. Um, we're going to meet. We're going to see the angels and we're going to see people who have been dead? Oh, yes. What a, what a manifesto. Verse 4. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity the meek, for the meek of the earth and he shall... Smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. There it is again. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. And the verses continue. Verse 9. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the water cover the sea. So, that's true peace. And as a result of God's peace, there is Harmony, verse 5, in the animal kingdom. Verse 6, the wolf and the lamb and the leopard and the kid. And verse 8, uh, verse 7, the lion and the ox. Verse 8, the young child shall put its hand where the snake is. The asp, the cockatrice, the adder. You see, what that is showing is that through the effects of God's peace, it would be like a, a stone thrown into a mill pond. And the ripples extend, extend to the uttermost parts of the end of the mill pond. Just pervading out. That, that's the effects of God. God's peace. 
whilst we're in the vicinity, after chapter 11, chapter 9, back up a page or two, chapter 9 and verse 6. For unto us a child is born, a son is given, and the government, ah, the government, that's topical, isn't it? And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Go back whilst we're in the area to chapter 2 and verse 1 to 5. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 1. The word of, the, of that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mount of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. Uh, have you ever seen a river flowing uphill? Strange. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the house of the Lord of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains. There it is, God's mount, and all nations will be flowing, flowing uphill. The most unnatural thing in, in, in physics. You, you never see a river flowing uphill. It has to find its lowest point that's what water does it finds its lowest point that's what we talk about sea level and the most natural thing in the world it's saying is that nations will be flowing uphill to Jerusalem and many people shall say come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the house of the Lord to the God of the house of Jacob and he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths what a lovely thing Verse 4, and he shall judge, ah, and he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall I learn war any more. What a lovely thing. And Romans chapter 14 and verse 17, so you know that those verses are there. Romans chapter 14. And verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. What a lovely thing that is. Righteousness and peace. Notice that. God's judgments, there it is again, that's always the equation. God's judgments, then righteousness that will bring in peace. It is always the same. So, those of you who were wondering what United States president it was, now you will say, well, that's a bit outdated, Brother Kitson. Well, for, for good reason. For good reason. It is a bit outdated. George W. Bush coined the phrase Roadmap to Peace along with the Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Olmert and the Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas. And so what they did was, headed up by George W. Bush, is to, is to bring about then this idea that they could solve the problems in the Middle East by bringing about and, and introducing a roadmap to peace that they had set stages that would take them along the road to bringing about ultimate peace in the Middle East. He said this, the roadmap represents a starting point toward achieving the vision of two states, a secure state of Israel and a viable, peaceful, democratic Palestine. It is the framework for progress towards lasting peace and security in the Middle East. And you can't read that in blue. It says the roadmap for peace is a plan to resolve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. 
So here then is a man and these world leaders who know that the key to it all is in the Middle East. And this burdensome stone, we have to deal with it and sort it out. That's their idea of peace. But you see, man's idea of peace and God's idea of peace is on a totally different level. Worlds apart. Universes apart, even. God's roadmap to peace, that there is a personal hope of eternal life for people who commit themselves to God. Now we've come full circle, you notice. We said at the very outset that it's about starting a little nearer home. They believe that if they throw enough money at the problem, that they can blast the problem away. Throw enough troops at it, enough armed people, throw them in, and we're going to solve that problem. That's the Americans. And God says, my peace is different to your peace. Your peace is fragile. It's almost like a facade, a veneer, an outward show. God is saying, my peace is built upon wonderful things. That there is a personal hope of eternal life for people who commit themselves to God. God's peace is based upon our commitment to him. That is our peace. Jerusalem will be the capital city of God's kingdom. The nations will go up to Jerusalem to worship. This is part and parcel of God's, God's roadmap to peace. Do you know the Bible describes the Lord Jesus Christ as being our peace? Jesus not only created peace, between God and man, the Bible says, and Christ, who is our peace? Jesus is our peace. Jesus is the means by which we can have peace with God. And that's the point, isn't it? It's not making peace with the nations round about to write um, you know, agreements and have all these, these treaties and talks, because we know in 12 months' time, it's going to break down. The true way to peace is having that peace with God. Through baptism, through the acknowledgement of our sins and the forgiveness of our sins, through the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's how we make peace with God. Nations will go up to Jerusalem to worship. Death will be a thing of the past. There will be a resurrection of the dead. There will be no more pain and suffering. God has set out in his word his plan of peace with the world. Jesus Christ will return to the earth again. He will establish God's kingdom when he returns. The Middle East will be a place of conflict when Jesus returns. We know that through the Bible. So if we think things are bad now, Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Jesus also says, to look out for those things that will come on the earth. War. Famine, distress of nations, men's hearts, hearts failing them for fear. Jesus warns us that in the last days, there's going to be so much 
in the world, violence and corruption. And so it's important for us then now, whilst there is the opportunity to make peace with God. Through baptism, for our faith in him, through recognizing that we must follow the Lord Jesus Christ. The kingdom of God will be established on earth. Jesus will be king in Jerusalem. His rule will be worldwide and his government will bring eternal righteousness and peace. That's God's roadmap. That's what God has planned, mapped out for us over thousands of years. Written in his book over a period of 1500 years. In these 66 books of the Bible, to painstakingly provide us with the way. Jesus describes himself as the way, the truth, the life. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. And so many of our interested friends may believe that when we die, we go to heaven. Well, the Bible doesn't say that. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God's will is always done in heaven through the angels. And Jesus wanted God's will to be done on earth. In totality thy will be done on earth God has a plan with the earth Bush embarks on Middle East visit US President George W Bush is due to in Jerusalem on a landmark visit in the region to help kickstart peace talks between Israel and Palestinians Palestinian leader Mahmoud Abbas and Israeli MP Ehud Almert vowed at a US summit last year to try to achieve a two-state solution by the end of 2008. It is Mr. Bush's first visit to Israel and the West Bank since taking office. The world leaders, they come and they go. Oh yes, they come and they go, brushing aside skeptics by insisting the time is right for Israeli and Palestinians to end their six decade conflict. Six decade? Com decade? How long is a decade? 10 years? 60 years? We can find the origins way back in the early chapters of Genesis, where the two children struggled in the womb. It goes right back into Genesis. What a thing. And so, reading the joint statement by the Israelis and Palestinian Bush said, the two sides agree to engage in vigorous, ongoing and continuous negotiations and shall make every effort to conclude an agreement before the end of 2008. 2008? So, they're there. Trying to bring about everlasting true peace. They're trying. They come and they go. We move on to the next president. Obama tells Israel to revive peace talks. We've heard this one before. Barack Obama has warned that Israel faces mounting international isolation and deepening security problems unless... The stricken peace process with the Palestinians is brought back to life. So what happened to Bush? They come and they go. It's interesting, isn't it, that the Israelis just had their uh, national elections. Benjamin Netanyahu, in again, extremist, working, trying to survive in the midst of hostility. True peace can only come when Jesus returns. And so we've put this blank. 
president just about ready to uh, give up office eventually? They're just starting in America now to, oh, I'm going to be president, and so they're, right? Jockeying for, for the best position, who will take up now the leadership. And there is a long road to the White House. What have they achieved, really? A lot of talks, a lot of discussions, a lot of handshaking. They will never solve the problem in the Middle East. Do you know why? Because there has to be judgments first. And after the judgments, there has to be righteousness, God's righteousness. The Bible says that there is no none righteous, none, not one. So how can we who are unrighteous, the Bible also says our righteousness is as filthy rags. So we who are unrighteous, can we solve a problem that needs righteousness? We are flawed characters, creatures of the dust. We need God's judgments to bring about righteousness, to bring about peace. Oh no, everlasting peace. That is it. And so they talk about partitioning the land. We'll, 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 we'll solve it by, we'll carve up the land. We'll give you that, keep you happy. We'll give you that, keep you happy. And we'll, keep the, we'll, we'll, we'll give you a bit of everything. We'll keep you all happy. That's how we're going to solve the problem. Really? Obama tells Israel to revive peace talks. Oh, yes. That's my final slide. Presidents will always say, let's have some peace talks. It won't get very far. I can promise you that. God's roadmap to peace has been set before us 